I think what we'll do is we'll get the program started. I'm uh, Donald Scott Walker. You'll see as I share my screen a uh, slide coming up of uh, Scotty Data Walker. Um, and that's sort of a company I started a number of years ago. And in that uh, opportunity, it's been able to focus a lot on the uh, development and uh, research into biologicals and biostimulants. So we'll get her started here. So there's my uh, company name, uh, specializing in soil and plant health has been a tag that I've had associated with me for some two or three decades now. And that has sort of led me uh, into becoming dependent some years ago, where now I, I really focus heavily on the study, research and development of biologicals and biostimulants, right? And what I'll cover off today is just a couple of products to focus on, one in particular. But by and large, I want you to learn how to recognize the, these things. And then, hence the reason Scotty Data Walker is I'm always looking for materials where I can identify an ROI from, the, you know, from their use. And really, that is the key to success in all that we are doing here, be it from the manufacturing all the way down to the, the year end user opportunity is to do that. So here we go. So we've got that process going and we'll jump right into the rest of it. So one of the things I've been doing for a number of years is traveling to different countries and following what they call the uh, European Biological Industry Council. They established uh, themselves back as far back as 2012 as a regulatory body in Europe. And in that process, they've developed this definition of what is a biostimulant. And then they've got this full definition there. Many countries have followed that uh, program as well, but there's been too many stumbling blocks as they pre presented this to their governing bodies. Of course, in Europe, there's many countries involved in the European Union, and they've run into a snag because of the, the word biologicals and biostimulants. So here in Canada, what they've done is they've, they've put this whole category of biologicals and biostimulants under the uh, category of a supplement. And what that means, as you can see in this uh, definition they've come up with, is any substance or mixture of substance other than fertilizers that are manufactured, sold, or represented for the use, improvement of physical conditions of the soil. Okay, so when that aids plant growth and the yields, that's going to be in this category now of what it means to be a supplement through our governing body, which is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. They're the governing body of all of this. Now, why is this such, this such an imperative importance to all of this? And I want to bring this to you from a national and an international scale. And that's why I throw this uh, photograph up here of a, a slide I took a number of years ago of a facility being built in uh, Europe. There's a number of these manufacturing facilities now uh, in Canada and all across the United States. And that's why it's been imperative for ourselves to put together a definition in an effort to protect these industries as they put in these million dollar facilities. Some of them are gonna be billion dollar uh, businesses where they're globally in charge. In fact, one company right now I'm doing some work with is actually pursuing uh, an opportunities to develop this in India where their agriculture is quite, quite a bit different. Now I throw this slide up because it's gonna move into this paradigm shift of looking at this uh, soil rhizosphere, as well as all the carbon uh, building up of in the soil itself from the use of some of these biostimulants because we're so prone to looking at the crop, which is really just the tip of the iceberg, where all the activities are really occurring that support the yield and that ROI up top, there's really this driving force of energy and development in the rhizosphere that's below the soil. And that's the base of all that we're doing. And this is a slide I took some years ago. Um, and the really, really reason I took it, I don't want everybody to get lost in too many numbers as I go through the next slides, but this chap at the bottom left actually had his hand over his mouth going, oh my gosh, so I, these slides can be overwhelming. But I really like this one in particular because it really sets the stage of what I mean by looking at the bottom part of that um, iceberg. If we identify maize, for instance, and we think of a corn plant that's really large and has this canopy, and we're all caught in this thought of the better biomass I can create above the ground, the greater carbon pool I can develop in the soil. And that's breaking down those organic carbons from the, uh, the trash. But when you look at this top here, it says below carbon inputs, okay? And this is all retained in your soil organic matter 
And that's part of what I call the organic pool. So the root system is actually contributing 61% of all the carbons that are being emitted there. And where in actual fact, the top part, above ground parts are only contributing to 5% of that soil organic compound building. So I'm really trying to get us to understand that any impact I can generate through the use of biologicals or biostimulants is gonna enhance the whole body of below that soil surface. And that's where all our money lies. Now, you often hear about these cover crops and working with a, a cocktail of root exudates and a cocktail of different species. And that really is to establish even a greater composition of all these materials that are creating this rhizosphere from different plants. You'll see on the left all these words and all these fancy science words where I don't want to get lost in the shuffle. Just want you to understand that this is the key to what everybody's talking about in terms of doing crop rotations is one place or companion planting or using a multitude of, of, of species as a cover crop to enhance the building and and I guess it would be an overall general picture of the rhizosphere that have greater benefits because everything down there ebbs and flows, lives and breathes amongst itself and everything else. So these are some of the issues that I saw in a presentation years ago and I've always liked this slide and I've kept it. I've just recently bring it in. This particular gentleman was identifying the diversity he uses as a rotational crop between potatoes. He's now at the point where he's not fumigating the soil anymore, he's not using fungicides anymore, and he's not using pesticides. He's using an array of materials to help him work out this whole cocktail of exudates through all this diversity to generate all those exudates that help create a functionality in the soil that will interfere with the development and high rise of all these pests that we're trying to deal with all the time. And this slide is in there to give you an appreciation, the, the importance of what we can do in terms of a biostimulant. Uh, whichever one this is on the right that creates this, it, this opportunity for us and I'm going to explain here, I'm not aware of it. I've tried to work with different labs and scientists to identify the exudates that count this along the path. I don't know if there's any of you in the crowd that have worked with me a number of years ago where I discovered that an application of a group of biostimulants, uh, Lignojule was one of them, and that was why I was so involved, actually reduced the incident of sclerotinia at flowering. So if you look at these bars here, and let's say I look at this purple one, I'm going to pick it out because it really expands as it goes into bolting. If I can use a biostimulant between seeding and vegetative growth to enhance the development of this particular exudate and take it to the point where it's really building up the soil, it's a what if factor. What if this particular element is the one that actually starts to consume some of the sclerotia bodies in the soil that create the whole mushroom process Process of spewing spores into our crop and creating sclerotinous issues in our canola. And that is a thing that I discovered. I was never able to get anybody in the industry, uh, even the Canola Council, the odd person I would run into when I was traveling to different shows and meeting people in round tables. Nobody's ever got to the point where they've taken this to another level. I sincerely believe that there will be an opportunity that's going forward in the world of science as more biologicals and biostimulants come to the marketplace and we establish these opportunities that create ROI, that there'll be these spin-off effects these functionality changes that occur in the soil because the soil inherently wants to be healthy. It wants that environment that's going to ease itself into more reproduction. Again, all that is occurring below the surface of the plant. Anything I do to the crop up above, for instance, if I use a half rate fungicide, I've now taken out a whole whack of different beneficial fungi at the surface where the temperatures are warm first, where all this activity has the greatest level of oxygen. So I've got a great aer aerobic composition opportunity. So if I really focus on that and start to eliminate those half rate fungicides and herbicide, I'll create the beneficial opportunity to build that rhizosphere down below with more beneficial opportunities to actually subdue the disease. Our disease is coming from the soil rhizosphere and the soil itself. There's billions and billions of, of biological elements in that soil. It's not as though we have a spaceship traveling across our, our globe, spewing diseases down on our crops. The actual fact that we all know this below it is coming from the soil surface. So what can I do in an opportunity to eliminate some of these things? 
So through the process of research and development, these are a number of products that I've been trialing, uh, researching, studying, uh, some of them going into replicated trial. As many of you know, I'm a Lignajul fan. And part of the reason I have such a strong base of info is I've been working with this particular material for about 17 years now. Now, recently, I've been studying new inoculants. Everybody and their dog has got an inoculant today. And now they're adding new features to the inoculants. Perhaps it's Bacillus subsilis that'll help the crop establish better root systems and create a better uh, opportunity of uptake of phosphorus and endophyte development and all these things are coming together. I've studied a number of amino acids in the past. Um, really, when you see the word peptides and proteins, they're all brought together. And the end result is your amino acids. Uh, there's all kinds of seaweed from the kelp extracts that have all these cytokines and auxins. A number of the lectures I attend to when I go to these world congresses around the world, they're now breaking down these seaweed products. And wouldn't you know it, Canada is probably supplies 50% of the world use of, of kelp extracts from Acadia out on the coast, on the East Coast. Then there's all these nitrogen stabilizers. I fell into this because of the impact the lignojule has on stabilizing all these different things. But a lot of these nitrogen stabilizers are coming from polysaccharides going forward, your urea inhibitors and things of the sort. And now we're moving into this great big group of all these bacteria groupings. Some of them are going in furrows. Some of them are on foliar. For instance, the ACF that Carlisle has been working with for a number of years now is one that we're trying to get in the soil. Some of it's surface applied. It's a group of functioning bacteria and they move forward. I've done research on a nitrogen fixing bacteria out of Australia, as well as the, uh, the manufacturers and developers of the ACF have got a, a foliar application now where they're looking at a nematicide control with biologicals, controlling Fusarium uh, root rock, controlling Fusarium head blight. There's a lot of these things that are evolving rapidly. I'll now go into the focus on the lignajule because it's a biostimulant that has a, a lot of science behind it. And everybody says, you know, Scotty, give me an idea what some of these things are doing. And this is an ACF product that Daryl has access to all. And there's these five bacteria. And these bacteria work together as a functioning group. And they change the entire environment of that soil. It's not so much the product itself. It's the generation of this functionality in the soil that spins off from their use that gives this holistic approach uh, how we change this whole paradigm shift of looking at that system. So the lignogel, what does it do, okay? What are we looking for when we pursue this? Well, it's a natural occurring biopolymer energy source. There's a mainstay of what it is, and it's coming from renewable plant-based lignans from the pulp industry. When they remove the lignans from pulp, which allow us to have white paper, these uh, byproducts go into a tailing pond. Unfortunately, they're like a hockey puck in water, so they're, they're processed. They're actually generated to be 100% water soluble, and it now carries an energy pack of 13.9 kilojoules. When you think of why am I talking about energy and it sounds kind of out there and funky, it's actually the same thing as sunshine. Sunlight is energy, and that drives the whole photosynthetic process. This product in itself has different formulas and opportunities where it can be applied to the soil, it can be used as a foliar op op opportunity, and it can be used for a seed, and they're all independent of each other structure of response. It's, yes, it's different formulas of the same base uh, product from the pulp industry, but they drive a different response, whether it's used in the soil with fertility, whether it's used on the seed at planting, or if it's used as a foliar. Some of this stuff I'll unveil as I go. So one of the main attributes of the lignajule is its ability to, to help the crop to create a higher level of photosynthesis. And that's really all that drives the agriculture industry. How do we know all these things? Well, that's because over a period of uh, 40 years since it's years of being developed a long time ago in the late 80s is when it finally hit the marketplace. It's all been established through third-party replicated research, whether that's done in a lab at the science level, whether that's done in the field as replicated field plots, or whether it's done at a research station under small plot work. The level of scientific information behind this particular product is intense. And that's one of the reasons I'm always focusing on data. A great story is a great reason to buy a product. But if you don't have the data to support that story, then we don't know what to expect from the responses of their use. So going forward in five words or less, what 
does the lignin jewel do? What supports its use? First off, it helps the crop generate a higher level of photosynthesis and photosynthetic process. The second one, when it's used in the soil with fertilizer, it's a mineralization process. For instance, when used with nitrogen, it actually creates an immobilization attribute. Then the next thing is standability. What does that show me in the field? For a long time, I saw standability, and the science has been established as to exactly why do I get that standability. Again, it goes down to the data. Then at the other end of it, for all those who are really interested in using products and gaining it, it's all about the quality and it's all about the yield. It's the ROI and the opportunity for people to develop a return on that investment at a significant level on a regular basis. So I want to take a moment here, put together the video that I've, I've had for a number of years on photosynthesis. Believe it or not, folks, we farm sunlight. It's the driving force of all the growth. And remember when I showed you the picture of the iceberg? The, believe it or not, that upper portion of the crop that we see all the time drives the rhizosphere over and over and over again all year long. As long as I have green material, I've got a live active rhizosphere. So what I'll do here, I'm hoping that this works, folks, is I'm going to listen to this video. It's about, I uh, call it uh, three minutes. Plants provide us with food to eat and oxygen to breathe. They perform this amazing feat by the process of photosynthesis. Let's take a closer look. Photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide, which diffuses into the leaf through small pores, and then enters the cells. Inside the cell, carbon dioxide diffuses into the chloroplasts, where photosynthesis takes place. Chloroplasts use energy from light to transform carbon dioxide and water into sugar and oxygen. Zooming into a chloroplast, we see these flattened membranous sacs called thylakoids. Here, light energy is converted to chemical energy in the first phase of photosynthesis, the light reactions. The two green structures you see here are photosystems, large complexes of proteins and chlorophyll that capture light energy. An electron transport chain connects the two photosystems. Notice the small mobile electron carriers that shuttle electrons from one large complex to another. Now let's take a closer look at the steps of the light reactions. The photosystem on the left absorbs light energy exciting electrons that enter the electron transport chain. Electrons are replaced with electrons stripped from water, creating oxygen as a byproduct. The energized electrons flow down the electron transport chain, releasing energy that is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, into the thylakoid. In the photosystem on the right, light energy excites electrons, and this time the electrons are captured by an electron carrier molecule. NADPH. The high concentration of hydrogen ions inside the thylakoid powers ATP synthase, producing ATPs. The light reactions in the thylakoid have produced two energy products, ATP and NADPH, that will now power the production of sugar in the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle takes place outside the thylakoids in the stroma, the thick fluid of the chloroplast. At the beginning of the cycle, Carbon dioxide molecules combine with molecules called RUBP. The resulting molecules go through a series of reactions powered by ATP and NADPH from the light reactions. Sugar molecules known as G3Ps are produced. Most of the G3Ps are rearranged back into RUBPs that will begin the Calvin cycle again. But the important product of photosynthesis is the remaining G3P sugar. Some G3Ps are used to build glucose, which can combine into starch or cellulose. Still other G3Ps form sucrose. And some of the sugar is broken down by cellular respiration using oxygen in the plant's own mitochondria, generating ATPs that can power other work of the plant. Excess oxygen diffuses out of the leaf through the pores, while more carbon dioxide enters. With three simple ingredients, carbon dioxide, water, and light, plants produce sugar and oxygen by photosynthesis, powering plant metabolism 
and ultimately providing your fuel as well. So one of the things, folks, thanks for bearing with me through that uh, particular slide. One of the important things in that slide you may have heard, and we're working here with uh, Carlisle Liquid Starters, and they're uh, a large supplier of phosphorus. When you heard all those elements that included the letter P, that is a phosphorus mineral. And you often hear uh, different fertilizer companies referring to phosphorus as an energy source. And you can see how involved it is in the ATP production. So one of the things that comes to mind is we have free carbon dioxide, we have free sun light and we have free water. How do we capture those three free elements to generate a higher level of ROI? And if I can find a biostimulant, and there are many out there, the lignin jewel right now we're focusing it on, and in this slide you can see an enhanced level of photosynthetic production from one single application. So that means today, when I do that, I generate more photosynthetic production, I drive more sugars, I drive more exudates, I create all these organic compounds of carbon that flow into the root system in that rhizosphere, offered up into that area as cookies and cakes to feed it. And now my plant system has a greater source of reaction or response to that rhizosphere. And I can develop greater root systems, I can create higher uh, nutrient uh, removal efficiencies I can start to create a higher carbon pool because if I can generate a 30% consumption great uh, increase of carbon dioxide that would stand to reason and there are people now in the science world that are identifying how much more carbon capture can I create from one application from one biostimulant and that starts at a ton an acre so if I can create all this carbon consumption I can create a higher carbon pool in my soil reserves. So now I have a greater significant uh, impact on water use efficiencies in the soil. And all that begins to turn my nutrient use efficiency beyond that. What does that look like? Here's an example where I had a station one day at a, uh, a science fair field day where my station was, how do you recognize a biostimulant and what is the importance of a biostimulant? So the lignogeal was applied on day one, is in southern Alberta, so it, it received water day two and day three. And the photograph was taken day six at the day of the field day. And these plants were laid out on a table. These plants are right on the line. They're six feet apart three feet into the treated, three feet into the non-treated. And your first assumption is, well, that stuff, that actually grows roots. But in actual fact, it's not growing the roots, the plant is. The plant is growing the roots in response to a feeding frenzy. I've dro driven all those cookies and cakes down into the rhizosphere. And that is working with the root tips and the rhizosphere to generate a companion process where we now have released all these different enzymes and proteins and elements the plant requires for growth, and it goes on a feeding frenzy. And now I can drive that. If I can coordinate these applications into areas and times of application where I get uh, reproductive opportunities, I can create more yield. And that's where the ROI comes from. Do I have favorite timings? Yes, I do. But fortunately, with the world of agriculture, I try to coordinate most of my efforts. Um, not all of them, because I'm always reaching outside the box, but most of my efforts are in an opportunity to reach out to the agricultural industry and apply them in a cohesive manner when all these other activities that are going on, and it can be implemented at the same time. Again, I'm trying to structure my work and the implications that we can have from biologicals and biostimulants of what's going on in that rhizosphere. Everything I do that benefits that rhizosphere will benefit yourself and the industry because it, it turns into yield and quality. And that's where the money lies. So, for instance, you look at this particular slide. We've got all these elements that I've been talking about in the rhizosphere. Again, I'm not looking at the top of the crop yet, which I will get to in photographs. But as I change all these exudates and I create this beneficial environment with a, a, an array of different types of exudates from crops and diversity, I can reduce the use of pesticides because I've changed that functionality of the soil. I'm not spewing disease into the air every minute of every day. Then if I create a higher efficiency level in that rhizosphere, I can now reduce the dependence on fertilizers. And we're seeing that in the industry over the last 10 to 15 years, where there are those who have been involved in regenerative ag for a long time, and they're actually now beginning to lessen the pressure on fertility. It's not less taxing on the carbon pool and that rhizosphere. 
and that's now evolving and exploding into all these other beneficial beneficial opportunities. So as we go through, we look at biostimulation and how do you figure this out in the world of science? It's easy. You make applications of things like the Ligna Jewel and you simply take that soil sample and take it down and break it down and identify the increase in fungi populations and bacteria populations. The upper uh, paragraph here is for corn. The lower paragraph is for soybeans because inherently each crop prefers a different environment. So for instance, we see an increase in corn but a fungi development, but nothing like the likes of fungi development under soybeans and bacteria to a lesser extent. One of the things that came out of a presentation I saw the other day and I found it to be really interesting and I'm really glad that it's getting out there. Um, it's probably this gentleman in the presentation will think it was relatively new. Uh, it is new, but it's 15 years ago. When you think of mycorrhiza, and we think about its ability to supply root systems with phosphorus and a couple of micro minerals. The, bacter the bacteria on the surface of that mycorrhiza is actually where it's getting its phosphorus source and which it is then uh, coordinated into that fungi and then supplied to the plant. The rhizosphere is really the the uh, the tunnel of opportunity for that phosphorus to, to reach into the uh, root system via the mycorrhiza. What does this look like when you put it with a, a herbicide or a foliar application? This is how we identify the benefits initially so you can see how the product's working. You can identify what is going. I see these kind of responses all the time and this is going to lead you to around a 10%, anywhere between a, a 8 and 12% yield benefit. These are easy to identify in a cereal crop within a week, two weeks of application. And what does that look like down the road? When you're using these different programs and timing, well, what's the best timing? I'm not gonna press fast to tell you when to apply a product. When a herbicide's gotta get done, it's gotta get done. I just know through all the years of tracking its application timing, when I put it on as a, with a later application herbicide, let's say four leaf, a couple of tillers, I now get that application onto the tillers. And that means those tillers now can generate a higher level of photosynthetic response. They get supercharged and they, they grow rapidly. And now they're not underneath the shadows of the main stem. They're competing for sunlight for the rest of their life right beside the main stem. And that creates the environment where all the tillers and all the main stems are emerging at approximately the same time within days of each other. Otherwise, when you go at, uh, let's say, three leaf breaking into four leaf or tillers are hardly present. I don't have the same impact on the tillers because they're not there. I'm not creating that photosynthetic response. Then over here on the right, if I don't even do it, this is where the tillers get trapped way down below because they're in the shadows of the main stem. It's like trying to grow an oak tree uh, and planting a new one underneath an oak tree. It's going to take years to develop because it's underneath the shade. These other photographs and, and practicing different timings. This is done at six leaf. We call it early elongation. When I do it there, now my tillers are heavily exposed. I don't profess that people are going to do that because they're just finished doing herbicides. They don't have the opportunity to go out there at that stage. But I'm trying to time all these different things and wrap all these different uh, application timings in to find out where's the greatest yield benefit. As far as I'm concerned, folks, I simply put it with the herbicide. I'm not going to fight that opportunity. This is a bizarre opportunity you have in canola. This is a significant change. This is not what I profess we see all the time, but it has that potential. I've seen people use it at three quarters a liter with first herbicide, half a liter with a second herbicide, and you can get this kind of response almost on a regular basis. But that's two applications that follow one right into the next. Here's a, a picture of a foliar application done at uh, head emergence on a cereal crop. Great moisture opportunities in this particular year. This is south of Winnipeg. This was a great yield response opportunity because we sustained better exudates at that point in time. But look at the standability. Because, because it was done with an airplane, you'll see the wave of application all the way through this. That standability comes from the science of laying down lignans in the stem because remember the color of the stem is green. And back to that slide where we showed the level of increase of photosynthesis from the testing. If I can create a higher level of photosynthetic product in the stem, I can then lay down higher levels of lignin transport along the outer sheath area of that stem. I can now create standability. 
Now, I must admit, it's not it's not a whirlwind opportunity. If I get six inches of snow in this crop, it's going over. But for instance, one of the benefits in barley, let's say, is if I don't get to that barley field in time, those heads will start to break off. Anything I can do to maintain the integrity of that stem is going to be of great benefit without having to stun it with growth regulars, without interfering with the pathways of the normal development through potash and all these other elements, we can actually increase the beneficial opportunities of yield structure, not to mention, folks, look at this bundle sheaf in here. When you can create that kind of homogeneous response, you now have mechanisms internally to drive the flow of moisture and, and sugars and all these elements that finish your yield. Yield. I can tell you right now, if I don't have good moisture opportunities, I can barely create, I can create standability, but the yield um, opportunity late season diminishes according to my moisture regime. If I got strong moisture and I'm doing fungicides out there because I'm concerned about disease, then I'm going to, I'm going to work and make sure that I put a ligno in there to generate the standability and create a, a stacking of yield opportunities. Then I go from there into yield. How does this look when I do all these different things? And these are all numbers that come out of replicated research. Is it 10% of 30 or is it 10% of 50? That is the key. All these replicated trials I've taken to the field and done field strip trials where I'll measure five to 800 feet, no more. I don't like going even to a thousand feet if I can help it. I'm not trying to measure uh, in the field the yield response, uh, whether or not it does a good job because one side's got five uh, shallow areas of uh, saline problems and the other's got three. I know which side of that strip's gonna win before I even do my test. The one that's only got the three saline pockets. I wanna eliminate all these variable factors. I've worked for decades trying to get people to understand the importance of short, uh, small, strips to identify the actual data of the benefits of anything, whether it's the lignogel, whether it's the ACF, any of these biostimulants and biologicals, we got to create good data because then I can make good decisions. If I create bad data, I make bad decisions. And if I'm going half a mile or a mile down the field, all I'm doing is saving time. I'm not achieving my end goal. It's not going to tell me exactly what's going on. Yes, I can get it done and I can make myself feel better that I did the strip and I got some numbers, but those numbers, according to the number of pockets of saline, because we all know that combine number, it's up and down, going up and down like a, a ping pong ball. I don't want that. I want steady numbers. I want to be able to hang my hat on the data that I've created so that I know going forward what happens. The data I created... How do we know that when I apply lignogel to a fertilizer like UAN, that I actually create a, a, a favoring of immobility? It's because a research paper like this gets done. I saw it for years and years and years, and it took some time before these were done. So the old name from over in Europe is lignohumate. It's a misnomer because there's no humic acid in ligno. It's actually all just plant-based lignans is you can actually change the atmosphere of that development process of nitrogen release. When I use it with a nitrogen source, I stabilize that N. In fact, when I do it, here's a perfect story. You'll see the square in here above this arrow. This plant, this is 2012, and this happens over and over again. That particular year, it got a huge rain. The canola didn't come up. The, the soil caked over. Canola didn't come up, had to be reseeded. Reseeded diagonally, no fertilizer, just seed, reseeded. After the crop began to flower, that trial came straight out of the field because it created this immobilization and the nitrogen was not lost through the ammonia release, nor was it leached with nitrates. It was actually immobilized by the ligno and the response it has physically as well as inherently with the soil. So just imagine the yield difference in that particular story was gigantic. Now, I don't want this story to be an ongoing thing because I don't like it when my crop gets caked over and have to reseed it for this type of response. But I know I'm looking for 10% from using it with these 28 products. And here's one at the BC Grain Growers Association where it's a research project where I was applying it to urea at high levels, three kilograms a ton. We go broke, but I'm trying to establish different rates and opportunities. 
This is just simply by putting it on your EIA and look at the difference and that opportunity there. Here's an area where you actually remediate the soil by putting in this into the soil in adverse conditions. This, this is a carbon and nitrogen issue here where it's been manured and manured and manured and manured because of feedlots right beside us. He couldn't even get a 35 bushel crop out of this heavily manured field because he's got the carbon to nitrogen ratio all out of whack. Things are being interfering. All I had to do was put a little ligno down and poof. I balanced that whole system. Here's a, a really interesting photograph. Again, this is 2012 up around the Provost area of, uh, of Alberta on the border of Saskatchewan, Alberta. On the right hand side, everybody can see that the crop is lush and green and gorgeous looking. And that's what we've been trained to see. We see, boy, that's really working there for you, Scotty. But guess what? The ligno is actually on the left. And what's going on in the left is the issue behind multitude levels, high levels of nitrogen. When we use high levels of nitrogen, it's inherently a problem of getting adequate levels of potash, boron, and copper. So when I apply the ligno and, and 28 together as a sideband beside the crop, I now interfere with a rapid luxury feeding of nitrogen, and I enable the plant to distinguish all these processes, and it picks up more potash, copper, and boron that changes the lignin structure and the pigment of the plant, so it now looks a lighter green. When actual fact, when you do a tissue sample of this, the nitrogen levels are identical. It's just that the potash, copper, and boron levels on the left are higher because it moderates and mitigates this rapid pressure and influence of high levels of nitrogen use, which is inherent to how we farm out west. We don't have enough season long time frames to be able to put a multitude of applications on. Like New Zealand, they've got 10, 11 months to grow a cereal crop. We don't have that luxury. We're three and a half to four months. But this is the implication that comes. This chap still uses ligno with all his 28 to the very day. Here's an implication of using the things like this ligno with a starter solution in sand, because now I'm creating a higher cation exchange capacity opportunity for the fertility program. So when I'm in a high uh, sand or a high PD area, the influence I get there is much stronger than I would get, let's say, for instance, in the uh, Red River Valley, where they have boatloads of organic carbon. It's not as significant. It's still 10%, but in these environments, the type of yield potential is incredible. The other thing I want to share with you from this kind of photograph, as well as this kind of photograph, when I create this environment, you know how we have this quarter section of 160 acres of a crop, and we're all darn it always waiting for that 40 acres over there to finish. It's always behind because of whether it's a moderately uh, zodiac soil or a saline pocket, or it's just got a soil texture that always creates a lag in maturity. When I put things on like this and I create the stimulation, I even out that maturity to the point where some crops from applications of biostimulant like ligno, it looks like somebody's gone along there and put a hat on that crop so it's all the same length. It's just remarkable. Some of the soil remediation process that occur from the use of these things. This is a soil from the Stetler area of Alberta that I took into the University of Brand and broke it down and I put uh, different treatments on different things. But the only similarity here is all the five pots on the right were treated with lignajule and all the five pots on the left, none of, the, none of those had lignajule. That's simply by balancing the structure and improving the rhizosphere and that opportunity for the root system to grow to access the minerals and moisture required for steady growth. What does it do to the soil structure? And this has always been something that's perplexing. There's 2011. I have guys that have used it ever since this. All their soil looks like the stuff on the far left. It's fluctuated, light and fluffy. I can clean root systems in a heartbeat. My root systems penetrate the soil better because you and I all know, folks, that if my soil is cakey hard as a brick, my roots are having a hard time penetrating that environment and I have less root growth because of that. If I use a coal-based product that everybody's talking about, these humic acids, I've been studying humic acids from coal for 30 years. I know, I know what's going on. So when I look at these different elements, it's all about their solubility, their activity. Do they tax the rhizosphere or do they actually add energy to the rhizosphere? If I can create extra energy in that rhizosphere, I now support it as opposed to tax it. And I can get these kind of responses in a matter of weeks. 
And then if I build on that and I do that one year to the next year to the next year, I now have better water use efficiency. I have better water use uh, holding capacity. I have better porosity so I can handle heavy rains more. There's all these benefits that are created over time that bank on each other. All the while, we make money as we go through this process. Again, what does that look like at the end of the season? This is it here. You see me using a lot of cereal crops. When I do canola, I, I lean on all the yield data because we all know in a canola crop and sometimes in a pea crop, there's different levels of branching going on. There's different stem sizes, plant populations. C doesn't get a, doesn't get applied evenly. Whereas a steel crop is remarkably even. It's a great crop to monitor the, uh, the stimulation responses in crop development. I love cereal crops for doing that. That's why I have so many pictures. Here's an incidence where the, um, the ligno was put together with a 1034-0 mix. I was always concerned because of the low pH and high salts in uh, 1034 oh but when I add stimulants to it like the ligno, look at the development. Even at that level, I'm creating a more even development of the tillers. Then I take this back to the, the use with the 28. This is all replicated research at the research farm level. I don't perform these duties. These are all jobbed out to research facilities across Western Canada. I simply coordinate them, whether it's the Lignajule or the Vitazyme or the ACF or the Creotech. I simply coordinate the efforts of these manufacturers that are coming to me from different parts of the world to help them identify their science here in Canada and help them work towards development of rates and timings of the various crops. I've got to create a data point and replicate a research then I try and take it to all my cooperators in the field from here to Timbuktu I used to do a lot of work in the U.S. but unfortunately with COVID I haven't been down there in the last year or so so it's unfortunate but I'll get back down there so that I can create the environmental responses if I can create the same response whether it's in Europe Australia New Zealand uh, U.S. And, and, and Canada then I'm on to something and then if I can get regularity out of it, then I know I'm into the money. And then I can hang my hat on and say, guys, we got to look at this. We got to pursue it. There's opportunity there. So I'm sorry, I zipped ahead there on you. So I go into an opportunity of putting it on the seed, okay? This is Ligna Jewel on a seed. This is on soybeans and this is on peas. And I want to tell you right now, when I see these photographs, I know it's a great, it's a great show and tell. And you'd think, my goodness me, there must be almost double the yield there. But we know how Mother Nature works with us. The yield response was more significant here than it generally is when I apply it to a soybean seed, which is around that percentage point of anywhere between 6 and 8%. And, of, and that's 6 per 8% of a 20 bushel crop or a 50 or 60 bushel crop. So it's moderate. If I put it on peas, I've got a group uh, out, out uh, west that have been doing it for five years and testing it on peas and lentils. Five years in the running. No less than 9% on peas and no less than 12% on lentils. Field scale trials, five to 800 feet foot measures, three measurements per line. And that's a stability number, five years in the running. How consistent that is that? The soybean one is remarkable. Our struggle though is getting the attention of the various uh, retailers of soybean seed to get them to apply it to the seed before it gets to the farm. If we can get guys to do that, all the producers in, in, in our area will improve the crop and get to the finish line. This is a regular occurrence on the peas, which I see time again. This is a branching impact. I don't see it every time. I'm more likely to see that branching impact from other growth uh, regulators and growth response products. The ligno just seems to push the yield. I don't get the same kind of um, branching. Vitazyme I'm working with right now, I'm seeing significant branching in a lot of the crops that do branch, like canola, uh, uh, color beans, peas, lentils. I'm gonna pursue that one. I only have one year's research on it, but it's something I'm pursuing going forward. So then, how do I figure out what formula to work with? Carlisle's to have, have an access to this product and all the work that we've been doing for years. Daryl and I have been investing a lot of time and energy in this product, and this is why. This is back in 2013 when we were first trying to establish, establish the right formula for putting it on the seed. These application methods are using anywhere between three to th uh, two to three grams per ton of seed on pulse crops. It's down to a half a gram per acre of seed and corn.
How do we establish which ones to focus on? It's this kind of trial I did in the Peace River country where I was working with different types. We're now all focused on type AM, where it's a consistent uh, 10, like I said, eight to 10 to 12% yield potential year in, year out. That's where the money is, folks. When you can start to get this type of consistency, whether it's 2014, 2017 to 18, and moving forward, if I can identify these kind of benefits at the research level, which these are, or into the field strip opportunities, I know we're rocking it out. And there's a lot of products out there this is a great story, but you'll see that this presentation is all based on response, research, data, all from third party, as well as some done in party. Back to that one with the 28, it's a remarkable material with 28. I'll leave it with this, folks. As we move down the shift into this paradigm of understanding the rhizosphere and the carbon organic carbon pool that we have in the soil and how we learn to measure that organic matter and, and create a testing pattern so that eventually we can get carbon credits. I'm involved in different facets. I'm trying to get involved in government positions where we're developing these credits and how do we get these credits to the farmer who are paying the, these carbon taxes. It's going to be in a scientific established way of doing this. I know the impact is there. Guys have been using things like Ligno and other stimulants for upwards of 10 years. Their organic matter is approaching now 1.5% increase. And over time, I think that that is going to start to snowball. And that snowball is going to get larger. So the impact coming from these biologicals and biostimulants like Lignogel are going to be nothing but imperative to pay attention to. Those that have worked with us are a cutting edge for years are way ahead of the curve, which is great. It looks good on them. But if there's anything we can do to capture a greater audience and move it forward so that I can take free carbon, I can take free sunlight, and I can take free moisture, and by applying something that might only be worth four bucks an acre or 450 an acre, and I can create a consistent eight to 12% ROI, we're gonna rocket ahead. And I'm gonna change that soil all the way along. Thank you very much for your attention, folks. I uh, really look forward to your opportunities and the phone calls that we'll pursue to Carlisle Liquid Stars as a result of these types of presentations. And I really look forward to your opportunities and you do well in the future. And safety to all and to all, good day. Just wondering if anybody had any questions for Scotty. We have a couple of people online here. So does anybody have any questions? Well, thank you, folks. If any questions come in over the next little while, uh, feel free to send your questions in. And uh, those uh, answers to those questions can be posted on the Carlisle uh, Liquid Starters uh, webpage. And I'm sure the boys would be more than interesting to answer those questions. And or they, if they're really getting tricky and down and dirty and, and tight into the science and you need to get a hold of me, feel free to get a hold of me at any time. And uh, we can work all those details out. Again, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we look too forward to your future. All the best. Cheers. There we go. So still no questions, folks. Thanks, Dwayne, for helping us host this. I really appreciate it. Uh, extend a great thank you to the, the gentlemen at Carlisle Liquid Starters for all their support over the years of helping us develop all this data and supporting it in the marketplace. I know the rewards are yours because you're well over a million acres today um, and it's a great uh, success story and I think as we move forward we'll find greater successes in the near future as some of the mainstream companies come on board and as we see more use of biologicals and biostimulants moving to the marketplace it'll be greater and greater and greater. Thanks guys.